Would you please turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4? 2 Kings chapter 4. Um, if you, if, in case you haven't noticed, um, this morning I am not a woman. Um, I believe it is important for me to say that because while I want to honor and speak for or speak with women this morning, um, I can never completely and wholly speak for women because I am not one. You are unique in your own way. God has crafted you in a way that is different than me. And, and you experience the world uh, different than me. The, you're, related, you're, related, you're related to by others different than me. Others engage you differently than they engage me. And that can sometimes obviously be a good thing, and that, and sadly, that at times can be a very bad thing. But we are different. Our experiences are different. And so I want to speak with you this morning, but I cannot wholly and completely speak for you. I was watching, uh, or listening rather, to NPR uh, this week, uh, because that's, you know, that's what nerds do. And so, and so I was listening to NPR this week, and they had a um, a, a, a whole podcast this week dedicated to stories about mothers, um, celebrity stories about mothers. Uh, Martin Scorsese um, and he, his mother and um, um, Judy Garland as a mother and her daughter um, talking and, and, and talking about and sharing stories about Judy Garland, uh, Trevor Noah and his mother. Um, Patricia Noah and Trevor talking about his mother. And what I noticed in these stories is the violent swings between joy and grief that comes with being a woman and comes with mothering. You know, for example, when you take uh, Judy Garland and her daughter, Lorna Luft. Lorna Luft told this story about when she first um, watched her mom on The Wizard of Oz. Judy Garland was Dorothy in the 1931 uh, Wizard of Oz. And when, and when Lorna first watched her mother on The Wizard of Oz, she was present with friends of the family. Her mother was not present. Um, and, and, the, and, there, and all she remembered was her friends telling, um, telling Lorna, that, hey, you see, Dorothy, that's your mom. That's your mom. Which is a great thing to say to a, a young child, to see that my mom is playing in the Wizard of Oz, except for the fact that her mom gets captured and kidnapped by the winged monkeys. And it freaks her out the entire time. She thinks her mom has been captured by the winged monkeys. She is panicking. She's crying. She's weeping. And every time she watched it, for some reason, if her mom wasn't present, she thought that that happened again. Not a great thing to, uh, to share with the child. But she finally got a chance to watch The Wizard of Oz with her mom. And when she watched The Wizard of Oz with her mom, it, it, couldn't, it clicked. Oh, this is, this is not real. Mom is okay. The monkeys haven't captured her. Everything's all right. And from henceforward, she was okay. And, it, and she shared it as a moment of, of joy, a moment of, uh, of laughter and, 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 and a, sen- a, a sort of levity to it. It was lighthearted. Trevor Noah, on the other hand, his mother had a, had a lot of levity in her life, a lot of laughter in her life, but it came through great pain and great trauma. His mother lived during the, the, the apartheid in South Africa, and she was in relationship with a white man, and that they could not be together by law. And so even though they had children together and even though they loved each other and they, and, they, and they had a whole family together, they could not actually be together. And so there were times where literally they would take her to jail because she was with this man. They would not take him to jail. They would take her to jail because dark-skinned folks and, and light, lighter-skinned folks could not be together. And she shared these memories and, of course, even when, even when that relationship didn't work out, the next relationship, Trevor Noah's stepfather, abused her violently and viciously to the point where there's a moment um, in this story where, where Patricia Noah is shot in the head by her, step, by her husband, Trevor Noah's stepfather. She's in the, she's in the hospital, and 
Trevor says that his mother is deeply religious and deeply Christian. Um, he's, she's, in, she's in the hospital, and she tells Trevor, she says, um, well, Trevor, that you know what this means with, you know, having recently just had surgery with this bullet having been removed out of her head. She says, Trevor, you know what this means, right? And he says, what? What does this mean? She says, well, it means that you finally can be um, the, the best-looking person in our family because I could not be the best looking person in the family with this bullet wound. And so he said, he said it was, you know, I never really got into the religion thing with my mom and I never really got into the Christianity thing with my mom, but man, I, it was hard to debate her about it because God spared her life and she had so much joy even in the midst of all of the trauma in which she experienced. And so it was so hard to debate her about it. I, could, I had very few words that I could use against her. And so you see these violent swings between women or violent swings in, mother, in mothering and in, in motherhood from joy into grief. And we see a violent swing this morning in our text in 2 Kings from, from joy to grief and from grief back to joy. And we learn a lot about God and about ourselves as we walk through this text about this woman in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. I want to point you to this woman. It says in verse one, one, I mean verse 8, one day Elijah went on to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. And so whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to and she said to her husband, behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp so whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. The first thing we learn about this woman is this woman's character. And this woman's character teaches us something about God and something about ourselves. We see from the scriptures that this woman is a wealthy woman. But rather than leveraging her wealth to crush people, it appears that she is leveraging her wealth for the sake of generosity. Now, this alone would separate this woman from many, many, both in her day and even in ours. But it is the next quality that we notice that really elevates her as a woman to be not only noticed, but learned from. She's a hospitable woman. She has incredible hospitality. Without prompting, she notices God's prophet Elijah in need of support and replenishment, and she uses her means as a woman of wealth to help God's prophet. In fact, she doesn't even wait for him to acknowledge his need. She initiates all the acts of hospitality that we see in this text. She urges him to start visiting her and her husband for food. She urges her husband to join, join her in making a small room on their roof for Elijah to take rest and refuge whenever he needs it. This woman literally made room for hospitality. She went and constructed a room to show love towards someone in need of support. Here's something that you should know about a hospitable heart. It must be reflected outwardly. You can't be inwardly hospitable, at least not completely. Because hospitality is more than just thinking nice thoughts about people. Hospitality is even more than cutting checks for people. Hospitality may include those things, but it is more so about inviting people into our lives. This aging couple brought Elijah into their lives. Hospitality is not just an attribute to admire. It is, in fact, a distinguishing mark of the Christian life. It is something that should separate the Christian from everyone else. An ongoing commitment to open up our lives in order that people might come in contact with the love of Jesus Christ. When the Bible mentions the requirements of leaders in the church in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3, it mentions a number of different things that a man must have in order to be qualified to lead a church. But you know what is mentioned in both of those passages? That the man must be hospitable. However, Scripture does not just reserve this charge of hospitality or for hospitality to pastors. They may be called to, to be models and leaders in this area, but they are not called to be the only ones walking in 
this area. Paul, as he is laying his laying out qualities of a Christian growing in Christ in Romans chapter 12, verse 13, he says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I mention all these texts to show that this is not something that Christians can, in fact, neglect. This is part of our spiritual disciplines. We are a welcoming people because we've been welcomed by Christ. We are an inviting people because we've been invited into fellowship by Christ. We are a people who are living or who are willing to open our lives to others because Christ has opened his life to us. How can a people whose eternity was established by Christ opening himself up to them close themselves off from the rest of the world? And yet, as Christians in the Western Hemisphere of the world, we absolutely do this all the time. We prize our independence and we prize our individualism so much so that we have closed ourselves off from the rest of the world that needs to see our love demonstrated through the opening of our lives. Some of us are too busy, some of us are too fearful, and yet some of us are just too stingy to open our lives beyond ourselves. And that was before COVID. I'm not even talking about during COVID. Obviously, COVID has made it even easier for us to live closed lives. COVID has made it easier for us to live alienated from those around us. Now that life is opening back up again, though, this is the perfect time for a fresh start for all of us. Can I encourage you this morning? If you did not before COVID commit to living your life in a more hospitable way, commit your life or commit to living your life in a more hospitable way post-COVID. Sisters, start this week. Take your gift card. Invite somebody out to coffee. I don't know. We only pay for one of you guys, so you got to sort out how you pay for the second person. <laughs> maybe if you invite somebody that got a card in here, maybe, you, maybe you're covered. <laughs> this woman is not only wealthy, this, not, this woman is not only hospitable, but this woman is discerning. She, she looks and she says to herself, behold, now I know that this is a holy, or she says to her husband, behold, now I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Elijah walks past their home and there is this manner in which he carries himself that communicates to the woman that God is with him and that they should open their lives up to providing him a space for rest and replenishment. The roof typically on these ancient homes were flat and oftentimes people would be, have access to these roofs. And so they actually built and constructed an entire new room on the top of their home just for this man in whom this woman has discerned is in fact a man of God. That's this woman's character. Now let's look at the blessing that she receives for her hospitable character. One interesting thing that God tells us about hospitality is that we should pursue it not only because it reflects the hospitality that we have received from him, but also because it positions us to receive more of his divine favor and his divine blessing. When you look at Matthew chapter 10, for example, you hear, whoever receives you receives me, chapter 10, verse 40. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Making room in our lives to serve and receive others is not only, or not only gives us a, 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 a way to by some uncertain chance, receive angels. But it also gives us a way to, by certain opportunity, receive God. According to the Lord, we may be receiving angels when we're hospitable, but we are receiving God when we are hospitable. Do you understand that? And making room to receive those sent by him makes room for us to receive a blessing from him. 
Matthew chapter 10, again, verse 41, it says, the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Through hospitality, we invite the Lord's blessing into our life. Now, how the Lord blesses us is God's decision alone. But we position ourselves for his blessing when we live hospitably towards the people or towards his people and even people that are far from him because they have a chance to come in contact with his love through us. Ultimately, even if we don't see the blessing now, we can have confidence that a blessing is being stored up for us in our eternal rest for our hospitality. Luke chapter 14 says, verse 13, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. In other words, you don't invite people in that are simply able to give you something. You invite people in that can't give you anything because you will receive all that you need from him. Picking back up in 2 Kings chapter 4, the prophet Elijah here certainly acknowledges that the Lord is in fact a blesser of those who open their hearts and their homes and their lives up to others. Because in verse 11 of, of chapter 4, we read this. One day he came there and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said to him, Say now to her, see, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. Even in this moment of uh, uh, where an opportunity for blessing is presented, we see this woman's generous heart again. Elijah asks her point blank in exchange for your hospitality. What would you like me to do? Would you like me to put in a word to the king or the commander of the army? In other words, would you like me to build up a little favor for you in the high places by putting in a good word? How, how would most of us respond? <laughs> well, hey, it sure won't hurt, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Tell, tell, tell Mayor Flax that I'm a great guy that's very hospitable and very hospitable and very kind. I mean, I mean, I have been pretty nice to you, right? <laughs> this woman responds with these words, I dwell among my own people, meaning that I am with my people. I have everything I need. I have resources. I have influence. I don't need anything else. This woman was doing what she did for Elijah not in order to be blessed by him or to receive a good word from him. She was displaying the hospitality and the generosity that she was displaying because it was simply the right thing to do. In a world like ours, when we see someone pouring themselves out as this woman is, the natural question that flows from such displays of generosity is, well, what, what, what does she want? We, we even get suspicions about stuff like this, right? Why is she... Why is she building this room for me? What, she, what, she, what does she have up her sleeve? But in return for unbelievable hospitality, she is seeking nothing in return. This woman is wealthy and at the same time hospitable and selfless. Rare combinations. It is no wonder that Elijah desires so much to see this woman gifted with this blessing. Now, as we will learn in, the, in just a moment, this whole sequence about Elijah putting in a good word with the king and her not needing that good word because she has everything that she needs and she is just happy dwelling with her people is way more fascinating than it sounds. But we'll come back to that. Let's get down to verse 14. Verse 14 of chapter 4, it says, and he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. He said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. And he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord. Oh, man of God, do not lie to your servant. 
the woman conceived and she bore a son at about the time the following spring as Elijah had said to her. This is an unbelievable miracle. Not something that always happens. Not even, this is not normative, even in Scripture. We only see it a few times in Scripture. And when we do, we, we don't even normally see it like this. It's typically tied to more prominent stories in God's covenant. Isaac with Sarah, Jacob with Rebecca, John the Baptist with Elizabeth. However, here we see it with a woman whose name we never know. With a child whose name we will never know. It is, however, no less stirring, no less powerful, and no less shocking to hear this. The woman responds as one of us might expect her to. No, my Lord. Oh, man of God, do not lie to your servant. The modern rendition, man, stop playing with me. We can tell from her reaction that this is a woman who is well acquainted with disappointment. She has been denied the joy of children, and now a man who she believes to be sent by God has come and told her she would, that, she, um, that she would be blessed with child. It seems as if this woman has already resigned to, the, to a reality that maybe this was never to be. She no longer even appeared to be interested in asking. And yet this man of God voluntarily speaks this blessing over her life. You can hear her saying, you don't have to get my hopes up, man of God. And yet there's a moment of great unspeakable joy because a year later this woman bears the child that Elijah spoke over her life. However, for some of you that, that, that are either in this room or that may be watching online, it is probably a little difficult to celebrate because it only rehashes memories of your own struggles in childbearing. Infertility is a common problem in our country. Over 10% of women in our country between ages 16 and 44 have difficulty getting pregnant or staying pregnant. So the likelihood of one or two or three or four women either in this room or watching online that may be struggling with their own bouts of infertility is a high, is a high likelihood. There are times when we read stories like this and people want to simplify your lives by, by saying, well, see, if you, if you live a more hospitable, hospitable life, that will ensure your fertility. Heck, maybe even some, somebody that's watching that's struggling with fertility has, has thought similar things and said to themselves, what am I doing wrong, Lord? Am, am I, is, is it because I'm in sin? What do I need to fix in order to fix this? And sometimes the answer is simple. But most of the time the answer is not simple. Remember, we know the Lord will reward our faithfulness. But brothers and sisters, we don't always know how he will reward it. The most complex thing in all of universe throughout all of history is the mind of God. We don't know everything, and we don't know why he does or why he allows certain things, meaning that we will never fully understand everything he is doing and every reason why he is doing it. Neither will we ever understand every effect of the fall that, allow, that, 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 that has been allowed into our lives and every, and every reason that he allows those effects into our lives. David said of the Lord's thoughts in Psalm 131, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. He said, there are some thoughts that are too high for me. And so at times when I don't understand you, I've just quieted my soul. Psalm 139, David also speaks about God's knowledge. And he says, such knowledge, when he thinks about God's sovereign ordering and control of all of our lives, he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain it. Paul, when he thinks about God's ordering and salvation, he says, oh, the depth and the rich of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Job, on the other hand, as he pondered God's ways through his own unbelievable suffering that included the loss of his goods, the loss of his family, the loss of his health. 
He pondered God's working as well. He was confused. But once the Lord appeared to Job and showed Job all of his might and all of his magnificence, Job responded this way towards the end. Chapter 42. God, you asked, who is that that obscures my plans without knowledge? I respond, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. In other words, Job realized even in his loss that God was doing things that was beyond him and that he spoke too quickly in trying to speak about what God was doing and God's intentions. Family, life can be incredibly difficult. We do, we do not have the answers to all the tears that we will cry. Like we saw at the very start of, a ser- of our sermon this morning with the two mothers, Judy Garland and Patricia Noah, life can carry very violent swings, and we don't always get the answers to why. In fact, just a few verses down from this moment of unspeakable joy, that this Shunammite woman experiences, we get a violent swing into unspeakable horror. Verse 18, it says, when the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. He said to his father, oh, my head, my head. And the father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he lifted him up and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon. And then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. And she called to her husband and, I, and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may go quickly or that I may quickly go to the man of God and come again. And he said, why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, all is well. Then she saddled the donkey, and she said to her servant, urge the animal on, do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out, came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, all is well. And when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And he said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you, as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child. But there was no sound or sign of life. And therefore he returned to meet him and told him, the child has not awakened. Saints of God, I cannot imagine anything more devastating than the loss of a child. But I imagine there is a special kind of devastation that is reserved when we receive a child that we were never supposed to have, only in our joy to have that child die in our arms. You can hear the cry of devastation in this Shunammite, this Shunammite woman's voice in verse 28 when she says, did I ask the Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? I had already resolved this in my soul. I had already coped with this. I had already realized that this was not going to happen for me. And I was fine. I didn't ask for this. You asked me what I wanted. I said I was good. I don't think there's anything more devastating than receiving a child that you were not supposed to have, only to have that joy 
snatched from you along with that child as he or she dies in your arms. Even Elijah, there's something confusing going on about him. Verse 27, he gives us a hint that there's something not quite right going on here. He says, and when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Now, Elijah typically can see things pretty clearly, but in this particular case, he cannot. He cannot discern what exactly is going on. There's, that's the first signal that something is wrong. And then we read in verse 29 through 31 this. He's, he said to Gehazi, tie up your garment, take up your staff in your hand and go. And if you meet any, anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. Of course, we know he goes and he does that. But nothing happens with the child. Now, I don't know if you've read many Bible stories before, but typically when you read these Bible stories, there's a man of God who has a gesture, who has an action, a special action for someone to do. And then that person goes and they do that special action, right? You, you know the stories. I mean, it's all sorts of stories, right? Here, take my shoe and go rub it across his forehead, right? And, and, then, and, then, and then something happens, right? The, the shoe's rubbed across the forehead. All of a sudden, something happens, right? You what, you don't have any food here? Take my shirt and just smear it in the dirt. And then all of a sudden, food shows up. Something always happens. Here, Elijah says, take my staff. Go put it across the face of the child. And his servant does it. Nothing happens. This is such a twist in the story for me. Typically, when the prophet comes with his weird and wild gestures to perform, they work. Here they do not work, and I think that it is intended to serve as a reminder that ultimately our help doesn't come from men. It comes from God. God uses men, and God uses women as vessels to speak into our lives. God uses men and uses women to bring healing to our bodies uh, and, 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 and nurses and doctors to bring healing. Shout out to Ashley. Congratulate. Congratulations. Ashley just got her nursing degree for those of you all who have no idea who Ashley is. But God uses these people to care for us, and, 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 and God uses our parents to raise us and mentor us and, and, to, and to be a source of nourishment and encouragement. But they are vessels of the source. They are not the source. Sometimes God will remind us of this truth. He has reminded Elijah, he has reminded the Shunammite woman that he is the source. Sometimes we can just get flat out too dependent on others. We're no longer looking to God. We call everybody and then when nobody else answers, instead of us going to the Lord, we just sit there. Like nobody's answering. Somebody's waiting on you to speak to him. Call him. Reach out to him. He's the source. God is the sustainer. God is the keeper of life. God is the one who is bringing you up from whatever ditch that you are wallowing in. It will be God who will do it. And so it is God that sometimes you must seek. There will be no other source to go to. He is the source. All the others were, were vessels to that source. So the prophet has no answers at this moment. His tools aren't working, and yet and still the woman says, it is well. She's heading out in verse 23. Her husband says, why will you go to him today? It's not new moon. It's not Sabbath. In other words, these are, these are typically days in which you would see these men of God. You have a request for them, make it known on that day. 
This can wait. There is nothing left for us to do. Our child is dead. Woman responds to him all as well. You're going at the wrong time. All is well. Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, runs to the woman, meets her, says, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? All well with your child? She responds, all is well. The room that she built for this man of God now is housing her dead child. She has brought this child up into the room and sat him there, and she has said, all is well. This is a posture of a woman who has committed herself into the hands of the Lord. If anything is to be done, it will be only him that does it, and I'm going to lean on him for whatever he does. All is well. All is well. And all was well. Because we read in verse 37... Or verse 36, then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. It didn't work when he wasn't there, when he wasn't present. But by God's grace, he went. He stretched himself over the child. Another weird gesture, weird act. But God was behind the gesture. And so the child came to life. Saints of God, life can be incredibly difficult. And we do not have the answers to all the tears that we cry. But here's what we can take great confidence in. God does not waste a single one of them. No one has the power to resurrect this child. Or the rather, no one else has the power to re resurrect this child but God, the one who resurrected Lazarus from the grave. No one else has the power to resurrect this child but God, the one who rose from the grave on the third day. No one has the power to re resurrect this child but God, the one who will raise all of us up into eternal life in the end day. Yes, life can have very violent swings from joy to grief, from grief to to joy, but take confidence in this, no matter how many tears we cry, God will not waste a single one of them. Whether we see it in this life, or we have to wait until the next to see it all fully and completely, you can take confidence that God will restore you fully for any grief that you have suffered. Saints of God, he is not only faithful to do it, he is powerful enough to do it. Here's the last thing I want to show you. Second, Second Kings chapter 8. Turn there with me if you can. Second Kings chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. This is so interesting to me in how God works. Now Elijah had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Arise and depart with your household and sojourn, and sojourn where, sojourn wherever you can. For the Lord has called for a famine, and it will come upon the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the man of God. She went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And at the end of the seven years, when the woman returned from the land of the Philistines, she went to the appeal to the king for her house and her land. Now the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, tell me all the great things that Elijah has done. And while he was telling the king how Elijah had restored the dead to life, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appealed to the king for her house and her land. And Gehazi said, my lord, O king, here's the woman and here's her son, whom Elijah restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed an official for her, saying, Restore all that was hers, together with all the produce of the fields, from the day that she left the land until now. You see what just happened? You remember, what, you remember, you remember the, the first discussion that, that Elijah had with this woman when he said, Hey, what do you need is it, is it for your hospitality? Is there something that you need? You need me to put in a good word to the king? You need to... 
me to put in a word to the commander of the army. She said, no, I'm fine. I got everything I need. I'm with my people. You know, I, I'm good to go. And then we read about this woman. A famine shows up. This woman has to leave. Leave her people. Leave behind her land. Leave behind her property. Leave behind all the things that she had. So she lost her people. She lost her provision, her possessions. And when the famine is over, now she has to return. And who does she need to speak to in order to get restoration? The king. So what happens here? This is what happens. God, through Elijah, is speaking about the provision he's going to make for her. Even when she doesn't even know she needs the provision. You know, sometimes we are fixed on the grief because, because grief is a part of the human experience. So we're going to experience grief. I'm here to tell you that. You're going to experience grief. And sometimes grief can have you so fixated that you miss out on this reality, this, this one reality, that God is always making provision for you. Even when you don't know he's making provision for you, that he is setting things in order for you, even when you don't know that he's setting things in order for you, even when you're saying to yourself with your feet up on your couch, today I have no need. He is thinking about the five years ahead where you will have great need and setting provision in place for that. God will never waste a tear. And God will always provide more provision for you than this life will take from you. Yes, this life is tragic, but our God is faithful, no more so than in Christ, where we see that he has made provision for us in our sin by sending someone to die on behalf of our sin and becoming the perfect sacrifice and dying on a cross and resurrecting from the grave on the third day with all power in order that those who didn't even know they had a need might be given everything they need for eternal life. And so you can take confidence, even as you are struggling today, and even as you struggle in the weeks ahead, you can take confidence that God is not only with you, but God is making preparation for you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you.